So thanks very much um, here on behalf of uh, Manaki Whenua Land Care Research. And uh, recently we were contracted by uh, MPI to do a bit of a, similarly to what Judy did at a national level, do a bit of a stock take of adaptation research specifically for the primary industries, um, looking um, at some of the outcomes and impacts of the Sustainable Land Management and Climate Change Program. And so what I wanted to sort of discuss today was really kind of what we know, what we don't know, and what we need to know about climate change adaptation. And why is this important? 7% of our GDP, about 80% of our market exports come from climate sensitive primary industries. And we know um, that drought, rainfall extremes are already being impacted and influenced by climate change. 2014, Luke Harrington and colleagues demonstrated in one of their papers that there is this clear sort of anthropogenic influence um, in New Zealand of rainfall extremes and drought in particular. And these sorts of things are going to increase in frequency, become more severe, their distribution will change with impacts and implications uh, for adaptation. So for primary industries then, for the sort of continued success, the resilience, the positive outlook for primary industries will require some form of adaptation. Um, and as Judy said, um, there's adaptation options available, irrigation is widely promoted, um, short-term tactical reactive measures can take us so far, um, but there will be some sorts of adjustments required. The ways in which New Zealand farms, the way we've conventionally farmed, um, will take us so far, but we will nonetheless need to look at alternatives um, to sustain ourselves in the future. So what we were tasked with was essentially doing a bit of a stock take Again, looking at the research on adaptation for primary industries between 2007 and 2017 specifically. And uh, what we did is we took a, a very sort of multiple methods approach, and I won't spend too long on the methods themselves, um, but we did some cost benefit analysis to actually determine, you know, was there an actual financial return on adaptation research? Um, we developed a timeline to look at the way in which the research priorities had evolved over the last decade. Um, and we looked at developing um, some frameworks across the whole of the SLIMAC program. We also did a, a review of the literature, both the published literature and the SLIMAC outputs, and then we also ran a workshop with primary industry stakeholders. And um, we heard this morning quite a bit about mitigation research. Um, and so the primary vehicle for funding a lot of that research over the last decade has been through the Sustainable Land Management and Climate Change Program. Of that sort of $50 million or so envelope, um, about 14% of that has gone into impacts and adaptation research. Um, quite a, a, a bit smaller in terms of the overall knowledge base on adaptation. Um, so again, between 2007 and 2017, um, uh, there was a, a similar review done, found about 220 plus papers on greenhouse gas mitigation in New Zealand's primary sector. Um, we did a similar review, we found 22 papers on adaptation. So, so there is a significant difference in terms of our knowledge base. Um, so what we did though is we started to look at this, sort of synthesize this body of literature, as well as the uh, 32 reports from uh, the Sustainable Land Management and Climate Change Program. Typically, when we think about adaptation, often it gets lumped in with sort of impacts. And the impacts of climate change, as we heard from Andrew this morning, um, can be characterized in terms of, again, frequency of drought, changes in rainfall and precipitation patterns, um, those effects on crops, um, so the changes in productivity, um, changes in the uptake of carbon dioxide, increases in pasture productivity, and so on. Um, we can look at the direct and indirect impacts of climate change. But those impacts, of course, have implications for land management. So the loss, for example, Andrew uh, mentioned this morning, the um, hydrogen cyanamide, high cane, which is widely used in the kiwi fruit industry as a, an adaptation strategy, as it were, to cope with warmer winters. Um, the implications of a warmer winter, the lo potential loss of high cane has consequences for your management. Those consequences also play out in terms of the decisions that you need to make. As a farmer, as a land manager, you might need to invest in capital costs. 
you might need to invest in additional labor. So what are the sorts of decisions you actually need to make? And as Judy pointed out, when do you need to make those decisions? We're quite good at reacting quickly, um, but what are the longer term strategic um, decisions that need to be made? And finally, are those actions working? Is there any sort of monitoring of those actions? Are you um, moving in the right direction? And how can we actually enable change? So as we heard from Wendy this morning, um, there has been a lot of change and a lot of action on the ground in terms of sustainability. Um, and how can we, in terms of policy, um, in terms of incentives, what are the sort of enabling factors that can um, promote and enhance adaptation action? So we, um, myself and the team of colleagues that I work with, um, promote, basically develop this sort of very simple typology, a bit of a, a device which we call the adaptation knowledge cycle, um, and which we use then to assess, basically, we stress tested the information, the published information, against this knowledge cycle to determine just what we know about the impacts, what we know about implications, what we know about decisions, and what we know about actions. So what do we know? Um, if, we, uh, if we review the sort of currently available literature on climate change adaptation in New Zealand, um, they certainly have provided us with new information, particularly in sort of three key areas, um, drought, biosecurity, and climate variability in extremes. This is by no means um, evenly distributed, um, but it does sort of uh, point in some key findings, which um, I'll discuss in a moment. Secondly, we've got sector-specific knowledge. Um, so we looked at pastoral farming, uh, cropping and arable, horticulture and viticulture, and then sort of cross-sector science, as it were. So if we take, for example, drought, um, drought is you know, often front of mind, um, living in Christchurch um, and working quite a bit in North Canterbury. Um, you know, over the last few years, farmers there experienced drought and then their experience with the uh, 2016 earthquake. Um, but when you meet with them and discuss things, it's always the drought that comes out as actually having the longest, most debilitating effect on their, uh, not only on their own mental and emotional well-being, um, but just on their own production systems. But drought is kind of one of the things that we actually um, discussed in the report as being one of the few examples where we actually have reasonably good not perfect by any means, but we have pretty good information about the distribution of drought, um, drought projections. We have historical analyses of how farmers have coped with drought in the past. Um, we have work on perceptions of drought and how farmers take uh, their own perceptions of drought and changing drought frequencies and use that in terms of managing their own risks, whether they're bringing in supplemental feed um, or whether they're changing stocking rates and so on. Um, and that information comes from sort of both the published, published literature as well as from some work that's been done in the SLMAC reports. And we've got that work for a sort of at a range of scales and it, we have case studies from a number of different areas. We contrast that sort of evidence base with biosecurity. And biosecurity has come up a few times this morning as being something that we are, uh, many of us, extremely concerned about. Um, it will, climate change will create significant biosecurity challenges, new pests and diseases. Parts of the country will become more warmer, better suited to certain invasive species, and so on. Um, we also trade frequently, ships ballast, um, importing uh, palm kernel and other things to supplement, provide supplemental feed for the dairy industry. Um, however, we don't actually have a lot of published information on biosecurity risks and climate change. There is some gray literature. Um, so Gavin Kenny, for example, did a um, sustainable farming fund project on um, biosecurity in the Bay of Plenty. Um, there's some work coming through the Bioheritage and National Science Challenge, um, looking at biosecurity in the broader national context of New Zealand. But for primary indus industries specifically, there's very little about um, biosecurity risks and climate change. Similarly, if we take a sort of a sectoral approach um, and apply the same sort of framework, um, pastoral farming, there's a, a wealth of information about adaptation, not only about adaptation, but about the impacts of climate change. Um, again, the um, in influence of carbon dioxide uptake and the relationship with pasture productivity and what that means for profitability. Um, we have information about 
rainfall, nitrogen leaching, um, and managing um, nitrogen runoff in a changing climate. Um, we have, again, sort of work around decision making, um, the types of actions and strategies that farmers can use, whether that's destocking, uh, the use of runoffs, supplemental feeds, and so on. So we, again, we have this sort of breadth and uh, reasonable depth of information. Contrast that with um, high value horticulture and viticulture. Um, so we'll take viticulture, for example, um, simply because I'm doing some other work on the wine industry. Um, it's our fastest growing primary industry. It's the fifth largest in New Zealand, worth about $2 billion. Um, and grapes uh, are inherently sensitive to changes in climate. So as well, there's a long lead time. So if you're going to change varietals, um, it's not simply a matter of changing rootstocks. Um, you think about the, um, you know, the New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, you know, 80% of the planted areas in Sauvignon Blanc, and we have an international reputation. So then it's, it's a market provenance um, question as well. And that, all of those sorts of things take significant lead times. So what don't we know? Um, so based on uh, the evidence, there's actually quite a bit that we still don't know. Um, so most adaptation research has been sort of geographically and sectorally defined. Um, we have, uh, you know, some of the, um, so APSIM, for example, um, we have the ability to run um, large-scale modeling simulations. Um, however, those cover very large areas, and we may um, miss out on some of the nuances. Secondly, there are some critical knowledge gaps, particularly around sort of biosecurity, um, wine and um, horticulture, for example, as well as arable cropping as well. There's very little actual availability there. One of the other big gaps is really kind of around that sort of second half, as it were, of that adaptation knowledge cycle. And I'll return to this, in that we have limited information about climate adaptation decision making, about how um, the potential or the perceived risks are weighed and evaluated and actually acted upon. Um, and we have these sort of empirical and methodological gaps. So in terms of empirical gaps, um, climate change, um, as we saw this morning, it will have this sort of national effect. And we know that for the most part, um, the sort of trend towards drier in the east, wetter in the west will largely hold. However, at a, at a smaller scale, at the scale of regions, um, we find very different um, coping capacities, we find very different impacts, and we find the um, range of responses to be similarly uh, complex. So there is a need then to sort of move beyond the sort of the national level um, analysis to actually characterize this sort of climatic, social, cultural, um, environmental diversity. Secondly, um, as Judy pointed out, the future, as we sort of, as we try to imagine what the future is going to look like, we're faced with considerable uncertainty as a function not only of emissions pathways, but also as a function of our, um, you know, human nature. Um, we're very, um, we find it very difficult to imagine a future that's radically different than the one that we've experienced uh, for the previous um, course of our lives. So we need to actually then develop sort of multiple adaptation options and assess those against a range of futures. Um, we need to understand the social um, dimensions of adaptation, what the limits and the barriers are to that. And we need industry specific, um, regionally based options and pathways. And I, and, I, and I mentioned that sort of regionally specific and locally um, sensitive simply because, again, most of the work that's been done on adaptation has been done at that large national scale. Um, we have some isolated studies for, um, you know, selected regions, as it were. Um, but, uh, you know, Andrew mentioned this morning, changing drought risk in Southland. And we have, well, we don't have anything. Um, you know, the West Coast, um, you know, there's work on the West Coast about risks of extreme rainfall, but that's largely landslides, um, debris flows, um, transportation and infrastructure. Most of that's hazards focused. Um, it's not really considering the large dairy industry on the West Coast. Um, Central Otago, um, premier wine growing region, changing frost risks, um, changing uh, summer dry, um, and again, we don't have a lot. So these sorts of um, 
adaptation issues are um, very local. Second, there's pretty significant methodological gaps. So most of the adaptation research in New Zealand is basically done in one of two ways. Either it begins with a model or it begins sort of from the bottom with you know, talking to people. And there's very little work um, that actually tries to bring those different perspectives together. So again, we need systems thinking. We need to take a much more holistic view um, to consider robust adaptation options. And um, as I was preparing this talk, I, I was reflecting on the, um, the last IPCC assessment report. And one of their conclusions was that understanding the human and the natural systems um, due to climate change. Um, so this is directly lifted out of um, Andy Reisinger and Andrew Tate's um, report on Australasia. Um, basically, you know, we are very confident that we don't have a lot of information about that. And we still don't. So how then do we move to a sort of a pathways or a, a, an approach that considers uh, multiple futures? So I just wanted to sort of highlight. So the, the last thing that we did in this project was we took um, a sort of a pathways planning approach, which is a way to consider multiple futures um, and develop uh, suitable adaptation options. And then we compared that with basically the amount of information that we had. And this simply shows that 65% of the New Zealand research and another 15 is on impacts, 15% is on implications. So most of our work is that Im impacts and implications and very little on decisions and actions. And that focus on impacts um, can sometimes lead to what Mark Howden at ANU refers to as Groundhog Day, where we're simply modeling or going around that modeling trap. Is it real? Yes. Does it matter? Well, let's do some more modeling to you know, refine our predictions. And instead, what we need to do is move beyond that. You know, can we do anything about it? How do we take action? And how do we know that we're doing the right thing? And to do that, we really need to open this up to a broader understanding and broader types of knowledge, from social science to economics to working with stakeholders to working with policy and decision makers. So in, just in closing, there is no silver bullet. There's no single type of knowledge that's going to be needed. Rather, we need a variety of strategies and approaches, not only complex modeling and systems perspectives, um, but qualitative, in-depth case studies from local regions. And most importantly, we really do need to understand the underlying structures of decision-making and human behavior. Thank you.